as we wait for attendees to uh, filter. Okay, excellent. I think it's time to uh, kick off the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Simon Clark. I am the EDU Committee Programs Coordinator. And welcome to a new EDU webinar series where we talk with a geoscience expert about a hot topic or big concept affecting the world today. Uh, today, I'll be discussing ocean plastic pollution with oceanographer Dr. Delphine Labelle. After the discussion, there'll be time for an audience Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, please enter it by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We can also upvote questions and questions with the most votes uh, will be more likely to be asked to the expert, although we will try and get through all questions. Uh, yes, so let's begin. Uh, hi, Delphine. Uh, thank you Hello. for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so to kick us off, could you tell us a bit more about yourself, um, who you are, uh, what's your expertise in, and how you got to where you are? Sure. So I am originally Belgian. When I was one, though, we moved to the UK. Uh, then when I was nine, we moved to uh, Africa and Asia. So that was during my school years. And then I've basically been uh, living in, in Europe for most of my, my working years so far. I did my undergraduates at Warwick University in the UK in biological sciences. And then I moved to South Africa to Cape Town where my parents currently live uh, to do my masters in applied marine science. And then my PhD, well, I took a small break a two year break uh, in Barcelona. I, I left academia for two years and came back uh, when I went to do my PhD in Southampton. Uh, and there I was looking at the effects of climate change and the interconnection between climate and the, the oceans. And really trying to see how climate change can affect the ocean circulations and how you know, this could in turn affect the, the weather patterns in, in Europe. And, you know, I've, I've got to say that that's probably the, the first thing, you know, why I, I decided to, to make this, uh, this change from biological sciences to more physical oceanography was really this, this global impact, right? So I'd moved around uh, a lot um, since I was nine. I haven't lived in one country more than three years. And so I've really seen that, you know, there, there are these common, um, yeah, this, the, these commons like the, the atmosphere and, and the ocean that are really, you know, you can see how there are uh, global repercussions. And, and so I, I really wanted to look into something that had such, such a huge impact like, like climate change. And then I decided to, fit, to, to shift my focus a little bit in this postdoc. So right now I'm in the Netherlands, I'm at Utrecht University and um, I'm in a team called Topios and that stands for tracking of plastic in our seas. So I'm still looking at you know, how the oceans move, but this way, this time seeing how particles in the ocean can actually move with the circulation and where plastic can actually end up. So this is the goal of our project. It's, it's a five year uh, project that is a European Research Council grant. And this, you know, with the aim to, to really see where, where does the plastic end up in the ocean? And my specific work is on seeing how plastic can sink. So we're really trying to build this 3D model of not just what happens with surface plastic, but also what happens once it goes, it goes down. So I'm looking at the algal attachments on the surface of little tiny pieces of plastic and seeing how that can actually cause it to either go down into the water column or go all the way down to the seafloor. And you know, this is really important so that we really understand the full budget of where, how much plastic is in each reservoir so that we can then you know, relay this information back to stakeholders that are concerned about this, whether it's fishers or whether it's you know, people that are looking at where to clean up the plastic or politicians. So you know, this is, there's, there are a lot of impacts that can come out of, out of this work. Um, and I'm also working half time on another project that is a material flow analysis of Dutch plastic waste. 
So basically how much waste is plastic waste is generated and how much of that waste is incinerated, recycled, you know, managed properly, uh, including exported to other countries and managed properly. And then the, the remainder. So what actually is lost to the environment? And again, you know, the this this kind of impact on on um, the impact factor really drove me to be interested in these two projects, right? So seeing where the plastic ends up and how much of it is actually in the the environment, um, even in you know a country such as the Netherlands, which has very uh, a good waste management um, infrastructure and, and system. So yeah, this is this is kind of a, a quick summary of of my work, my my background, and and why I'm interested in, in this work. You mentioned um, oceanography um, and how it seems like almost like a broader look at interaction. Um, when I was reading up on oceanography prior to this, there seemed to be lots of different types. So yeah, you say you're a physical oceanographer, but there seems to be good, more chemical, um, more chemical systems and such. So could you go a bit deeper into what is oceanography and also what is a physical uh, oceanographer in that case? Yeah, sure. So, so oceanography is, you know, we, we basically are just trying to understand how water moves in the ocean. And from that, you can really apply that to many different things. So the water transports lots of particles, right? Whether it's heat, which is important for climate change, whether it's nutrients that's important for the application to the biogeochemical cycle and so basically you know this is where it becomes more uh, biophysical and, and biogeochemical oceanographer uh, trying to understand where these you know these particles end up um, or even you know salts fresh water so it's it's really seeing how how the the transport is um, what is is driving the transport uh, and and how it's how that water is moving and what the the impacts of that movement actually are, and there are kind of two different types of oceanographers. Well, I would maybe say three because there are two types, and then you can have the blend of those two types. So the first is a, um, an observationalist. So it's people that go out into the ocean on a cruise ship. Um, you know, a, a cruise ship being uh, in the science world being that you go out and, and take samples. It's not. <laughs> not a holiday but it's very fun um so yeah so you go out to, to the ocean you take your samples and you use that data to to analyze and to try to understand the movement of the water and then there are modelers who are using simulations since you know it, it's really hard to have a global coverage of what is happening in the oceans right so um even though you know the, the a lot of estimations can be made from when you're taking samples if you want to have kind of a global understanding, then we have these these simulations, these global models, where we can estimate, you know, what's where the currents um, are going, and you know, have the atmosphere ocean interactions in there, and and there are lots of different um, these these models are getting you know more and more precise um, as time goes by. So the you know basically the resolution can get finer and finer. So you can start to really look at you know, if there are fine, fine scale details like mixing and, and all these kind of things that are that are becoming a, a very hot topic right now, because we really see that these these small features can actually impact uh, on the large scale, too. So. So, yeah, so in my in my PhD, for example, I did a bit of both. So that's why where the third category comes in, where it's, you know, uh, an oceanographer that that uses some of the, the data that's taken from from the ocean. Um, and the models and tries to you know validate models or tries to see comparisons between the um, the observations and and the models. Um, yeah, for example, I I went on um, on a cruise from Tenerife to the Bahamas during my PhD. Uh, so it was a six week cruise and and they basically have these really long moorings, uh, which is is one long cable that goes down to the the bottom of the ocean, and they have different um, sensors along this. Uh, this cable and they can make estimations of how the water is, how yeah, fast it's flowing, basically, yeah. Okay, so I think you mentioned uh, looking at small interactions leading to bigger, um, impacting bigger processes. Perhaps that could be a nice segue into plastic interactions. 
sure. um, <laughs> and yeah, so the key issue here is, is uh, plastic pollution. Um, it's listed a lot in the media. It's a big topic in science at the moment, in geoscience. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's an area of your expertise. Um, so to get right down into the problem, um, how much plastic is there in that ocean? Is that something we can quantify? Is there a scale we can add to that issue at all? It is a very good question, and it seems like it is a very obvious one, but it is actually extremely hard to answer. And so I've actually done a little bit of digging into, you know, the best estimates that we have, what knowledge we actually, you know, can say, yes, this is this is the closest to what we would, you know, we, we think that it is. And then try to estimate for you, you know, how much plastic is in the whole ocean, because as you can imagine, it's such it's impossible to actually go out and collect all the plastic and see how much it is right so we we cannot go and sample that so we have to make estimations so bear with me i'm going to go through a few numbers to those who do not like numbers you can just wait until the end and i'll give a very easy comparison to something that you can relate to but our best estimation right now of the plastic that enters the ocean in one year. So this is based off a 2010 uh, model that was from Jambek et al, 2015. Um, it's one of the most cited references for this right now. And they estimated that between 1.15 and 12.7 million tons of plastic enters every year. Now, to try to get some perspective on that, it's between 0.4 and 4% of the global plastic production in one year. So you might, when you're asking about scale, you know, is this a big number? Is it not, you know, 4% might seem like very little, but that's equivalent to between 0.23 and 2.54 million elephants <laughs> every year. That so, is a lot of elephants. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like two and a half million elephants max. And then when we try to use that estimate to see, okay, how much plastic is in the whole ocean, then we have to go back to 1950. So that's when mass production of plastic started. And since then, until now, the total production of plastic is 7.8 billion tons. And if we assume that, you know, let's take the lowest estimate of this 0.4% of how much is produced ends up in the ocean, right, per year. So let's say that then 0.4% of this 7.8 billion uh, tons is around 30 million tons. So that is how much plastic, if we use all of these rough estimates and you know we, we take the best estimates that we have currently, then it's around 30 million tons. And if that doesn't say very much to you, one reference that I can give you is that in 2018, there was a study that was made um, to try to estimate the, the total weight of all humans on earth. And all humans on earth roughly weighed about 60 million tons. So, you know, with these estimations and everything, the amount of plastic, the total amount of plastic in the ocean currently is about approximately half of the total weight of all humans on the planet. You say there's um, a sort of, I suppose, ways to try and measure plastic in the ocean, but does that mean we're potentially missing more plastic that could be out there? Yeah, so, you know, these, these estimates, so this model was taken from um, basically the mismanaged waste that's within a 50 kilometer uh, radius, um, 50 kilometers from the coast. And um, so this is, you know, saying that, and it's, it's taking population numbers around the coastlines, um, and so, you know, this could be an overestimation. So actually in the Jambek model, it was between five and, and uh, 12 or 13 million tons. And I brought it down to this 1.15 because of the fact that there are new uh, studies that are coming out that are saying this could be an overestimation because not all of, you know, the plastic that's mismanaged uh, close to the coast will end up into, into the ocean. Um, you know, let's, let's look a bit closer at the actual, uh, samples that you can take from the rivers so that's where you know this this uh number has has gone down a little bit um but yeah it's it's still i think it's it's something that definitely still needs to be you know developed um further and and a lot more samples need to be taken and and um yeah I'll, 
at some points uh, later on, I'll, I'll show you, you know, they've, the, one of the latest studies has, has just come out, uh, I think it was last week, um, in nature and, and showing that, you know, they, they did, uh, they, they took 12 million um, litter pieces and tried to classify them and understand how much plastic is in each of the different, in the rivers and the oceans and, and the, the beaches. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'll bring it up at some point. Um, but yeah. Um, you mentioned littering um, mm -hmm. and from like, just an observer, like the, the beach seems to be like a major focus of like waste, at least especially plastic, but all sorts of waste as well from um, like just random garbage to cigarette butts to so much. But is is that a major source of um, pollution in the ocean or is it more from more from rivers? There's another source you mentioned. Where Where is all this plastic uh, coming from? Yeah, so whether it's coming from, you know, the beaches itself or from rivers is quite hard to determine. What we have as the best estimates is um, that 70 to 80 percent of the plastic in the ocean comes from land-based sources. So this can include the beaches and the rivers and, you know, um, and there are some, uh, this, this means that the rest, so the, the 20 to 30 percent, is coming from fishing gear, um, so from ropes and from lines and even from you know discarded ships themselves, and um, this is you know this has been one of the the questions that I, I think a lot of people have been asking you know like how much is actually coming from from land and how much is coming from the the ocean itself, um, and there are also some regions where this amount that comes from uh, the fishing can be bigger. It can be a larger amount. So, for example, in the North Pacific, you know, there's this really large, what what is called in the media the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, or the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, if you're looking more in a scientific point of view. Um, and there, for example, there's a lot of fishing activity. It's it's a very intensive uh, fishing region, and so up to half of the total plastic is uh, has been seen to to come from fishing gear. So half from the land and half from, from fishing, yeah. Um, and yeah, but so so the question about beaches or, or rivers is, is a really hard one to, to get to. But, you know, if we, if we do look just at, at the rivers, then the, yeah, the latest research shows that 1,600 rivers in the world have the 80% of the, the ocean plastic that comes from, from rivers uh, is from these this 1,600 uh, rivers. Um, so, you know, this is this is quite. I, I think in the past it's it was estimated that it was you know first it was about six uh, rivers, then it was about 100, and now we've seen that there are actually quite a lot of rivers that make up this 80% of ocean plastic, um, or that comes from the rivers. I mean, so. Uh, you know, this is this is really something that is is quite new because we now need to focus on some of the smaller rivers too. You know, they do have a big impact, and actually, a, around eighty percent of these rivers uh, are in Asia, and one third of them are in the Philippines. Um, so, of these really high impact, you know, lots of uh, of plastic that's coming out, and you know, it's really important to say at this stage that. The reason why there is so much plastic that's that's coming out from from these areas is well, firstly, about sixty percent of the total population of the world is in Asia, so that's one reason. But the other reason is that they just um, they they don't have the the waste management facilities um, in place always to deal with you know to manage their waste. And there's also this issue of exporting from high income countries, you know, exporting plastic waste to these low income countries so there are lots of yeah we, we can't just you know point the finger and, and blame because there are lots of um yeah lots of lots of things that need to be um in, improved in order to you know to prevent this from from happening yeah so any solution will really require some kind of international collaboration at least um For sure. so i'm gonna i'm gonna put a little pin into that question because I want to return to that okay. but just as we're talking about plastic sources one of the questions I was asked 
a couple of times when I mentioned I was going to start going to discuss uh, plastic pollution with an expert was uh, the question of plastic straws. Big uh, media focus of them around 2015, 2016. I'm sure most people are quite familiar with the video of the um, straw stuck up a, a turtle's nostril. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does that deserve all our attention? Is that something we should be focused on? Um, these plastic straws, which are definitely seem like a, a lamb-based um, data source. Yeah, so um, it's it's a very good question and I'm going to answer it in, in two different ways, right? So firstly, the scientific standpoint, if we look at just the numbers and see you know, how many straws, if we compare it to other plastic uh, products, how many straws are actually in, in the environment. And when you see it that way, it really seems like a very small problem, right? Because the amount of the percentage of, of uh, plastic debris that is in rivers and that's in uh, coastal regions um, and, and on, on the beaches, for example, like in, in the on the shorelines is 5% or even less. And then when you, once you go into the open ocean, and you look at the sea floor, for example, and the, the river uh, bed, then it's not even in the top 10 categories um, of, of plastic waste. And whereas if you look at all of the uh, takeout food um, yeah, products, so this is ranges from uh, plastic bags to uh, plastic containers, you know, food containers, um, to wrapping, uh, to yeah, plastic wrappers, to um, water bottles and you know soda soda bottles, then all of those ones make up almost fifty percent in all of the, these different regions, right? In the rivers, in the on the coasts, in the open ocean. Um, so you know, it, there is definitely um, if you want to look at the one that has the most impact, straws don't have uh, don't end up in the environment as much as other products. But then I, you know, I, I would, I'd like to also say that it's, it's almost like a symbol for change, right? Like it's something that caught people's attention and, you know, say you're a consumer or, you know, you're, you own a cafe, a restaurant, and you start finding alternatives to straws, plastic straws, right? So you can have metal straws or, you know, they even have pasta straws or something um, or no straws at all if you don't need it. Um, then you know there's there's really this this kind of shift in in consciousness and and in awareness that you don't have to have plastic for all these products, right? And so it, it really starts making people think about okay, what else? You know, what's the next step? You know, and and it's it's almost this this start. I think it's it was a great easy solution and a, a great start to this this kind of understanding of uh, plastic not being a necessity for everything. Um, so yeah, so I think there's kind of the scientific point of view and then the social science kind of point of view. Yeah, so perhaps not the, the biggest impact on oceanic plastic pollution compared to others, but otherwise a, a great rallying point for environmental change or environmental awareness around plastic pollution. Um, yeah. Although of course something probably to mention is that when it comes to consumer decision, um, it can be a bit more complex at an individual basis. Yeah. Disabled people, plastic straws sure. are necessary as they're bendy, you know, they don't disintegrate, um, they can be made sterile and generally used without, um, or help people not to aspirate. But But um, yeah, so a good rallying point, although um, perhaps the next step to use to kind of push on uh, more more common plastics you find in the ocean maybe. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that kind of leads on to another point really is, well, what are these common plastics really? Are they mostly large? Are they small? Are they microplastics? What even is a microplastic? Yeah, so, so it's definitely the smallest pieces are the most commonly abundant in the ocean. And that's really because of this fragmentation process, right? So you have one large piece of plastic and that can fragment into millions of, of tiny pieces. And this is, you know, it's, it's a logarithmic increase. So as you basically go smaller to smaller uh, pieces, 
then um, or smaller sizes, sorry, you have many more, um, yeah, many more abundance and, and more total amount of, of those. So to give you an example, one uh, study showed that in the North Pacific subtropical gyre, um, pieces that were between 0 0.05 and 0 0.5 centimeters accounted for 94% of all the items that were found um, floating in that area. So really, you know, kind of think grain of rice size uh, and a little bit smaller than that. So that's really what ends and, and yeah, when, when you kind of think about where um, where this 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 plastic actually uh, yeah where it, where it kind of ends up so so the, the fact that plastic is entering the ocean as one item maybe right and then due to the fact that it stays close to the coastlines um, a lot so this is yeah this is kind of going into a bit a bit more of you know where the plastic ends up and everything but Basically, um, if it stays close to the coastlines, then it is a lot more, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot more uh, chance that it is affected by the sunlight, so UV radiation, which can cause fragmentation. Uh, then the wind and the waves, so that's this, this crashing, uh, you know, and, and basically the physical degradation of the plastic due to the fact that it's being uh, bashed against uh, the sea floor and, and against the, the rocks and, and sand. Um, and then there's oxidation. There are many ways in which this, this plastic can become more brittle and, and break down into, into smaller pieces. Um, and this whole idea of, you know, nanoplastic, microplastic and macroplastic. So our team is actually trying to move away from this classification because they've, there are very arbitrary values that have been used to classify this, this plastic, right? Um, so a lot of um, studies and politicians are using a five millimeter cutoff point for anything larger than that, it's a macroplastic, anything smaller is microplastic. And then there's another one for nanoplastic. And it's not like as if, you know, the, the properties or basically the behavior of, of plastic that is 5.5 millimeters and 4.5 is very different, right? So it's not, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, there's no scientific reasoning for classifying it that way. It's, it's just kind of a, a random cut of point. So we actually, in, in our team, we prefer to say, you know, to give the, the item its actual name, whatever the item is, when it is a one full piece, and then just to say that it's fragments, right? And give the actual size. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's, that's the answer to what microplastic is because it's, it's been a randomly chosen, you know, size category of fragments of a larger piece of, of plastic um yeah and i think maybe one last thing to to add here is you know um and that's that's actually linked quite closely to to the work that i'm doing in my postdoc is you know you asked whether this you know what what is the most commonly found you know particle and, and i said that a lot more of the smaller particles uh smaller pieces of plastic should be found uh, than the larger um, pieces, right? Whereas if we go out to the ocean and we collect a sample at the surface of the water, there are a lot fewer of the very small pieces than we would expect. So if we do, you know, we, we try to draw a line and we see, okay, with in this size class, we should have this amount of plastic. And we actually don't see that. And the reason for this is um, both a physical and a biological reason. So physically, there's a lot of mixing at the surface, so a lot of wind, and so this causes these tiny particles to be very easily mixed in the, in the surface waters. And secondly, this algal attachment that I was explaining about, it can, it's a lot easier for small particles to sink due to an increase in density when, you know, you just need a, a very small amount of algae to basically increase its density and to make it sink. Whereas for a larger particle, you really need a lot of colonization of, of algae to make it start sinking. Uh, so yeah, it's there, there are kind of a, a lot of ways to, to answer that, you know, whether it's found. It depends on if you're thinking about the total amount of plastic that's in the ocean um, or yeah, what's on the surface. So I think two thoughts that came to me when you were discussing that was firstly around the classification of I suppose microclass plastics, if 
I want to continue using that term is um, <laughs> it, it's really less like the size is important, but at the same time, the kind of product is also important as well. So, and the classification of size is microplastic that ignores the other side of it. Is that, is that correct? You mentioned um, <clears throat> you often look at the product and see what it is and just say it's fragmented. So is there other things to consider as well, rather than just the size? Um, well, so this, this study that I was mentioning um, that just took these 20 million items of, of litter in the rivers, in the on the shorelines, um, and it was really a global study. So, you know, they really focused on the items. And maybe I can share my screen and I show, you know, just one of the, sure. the figures um, so that you can you can see you know what I mean about this um, um, this classification. So can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see. Yeah, so here they really looked at oh sorry um, at the top ten litter items. I think since I've zoomed in, it might be a bit blurry, but you can really see that you know in the river waters, for example, they looked at uh, oh it's nearly gone. So um, that there's food containers is found 35 or 36 percent of, of the time in rivers and bags 16 percent in, in the shoreline and anything that's red is plastic. So you can really see that you know in the majority of, of the uh, all of these locations they really found plastic and and um, they kind of related it to take out consumer. Uh, plastic so it's you know plastic from plastic bottles to um, all the way through to you know straws are in there and and food containers and cutlery so you know there are there are definitely studies that are, are now trying to to look into this um, and yeah I just in case anyone is interested in more looking into this this paper a bit more um, it was really just published very recently um, and it's by Morales Garcés uh, at Alpha. So yeah, I think uh, I think these kind of studies are really you know really interesting to to really look at what what products are are there. Yeah, so up to date scientific uh, graphics. Uh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you discussed about small plastics sinking and perhaps larger plastics being near the surface of the ocean. Um, so are like most smaller plastics ending up in the the ocean sediment then and are are they more likely to be caught by these uh guys as you say like where's this or where's all the plastic ending up yeah so that that question is is really you know the goal of our our whole project of our our whole team and each team member is really looking at a different process right so i mentioned that i'm looking at this algal attachment and seeing how it can cause the sinking someone else is looking at the beaching someone else is looking at um you know how it fragments so we're, we're really Hopefully, you know, maybe by, by the end of uh, next year, we'll have a paper out that really puts all of these different pieces of the puzzle together. And we have one global uh, understanding um, with the best, you know, the, the closest estimations and, and the best knowledge that we have uh, to date about all of these, these processes into one, one model. Um, and, you know, I, it's probably important to mention at this stage that really trying to, to understand it by just looking at samples is, is really hard because, right, like 70% of the Earth's surface is the ocean and it can reach depths down to 11 kilometers, you know, in the, the Mariana Trench, for example. And plastic has really been found in all of the locations around the world. So from the Arctic and Antarctic to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, actually. Um, yeah, there was a U.S. explorer, Victor Vescovo, who actually found found plastic there. Um, so, you know, it's it's something where we, we really need to look at models to try to, um, you know, we, we can look at, at, at observations, but try to try to get an idea of, of where the plastic is going. We, we, we use models in our group and we use this Lagrangian particle tracking software, which is basically where you you track a particle as it's moving in the, the current. So you provide the currents to your simulations um, and then you try to track where the, the, the particles are going. And so we have a few, you know, there are a few things that we, we do know. So firstly, 
the large scale um, circulation and, you know, there's uh, due to the winds and the rotation of the earth, then these gyres can be formed. And so what a gyre is, is almost like a, a massive whirlpool that covers the whole of the, the North Pacific, the South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. So there are five of these subtropical gyres. And a lot of the, the plastic actually accumulates in these regions due to the fact that these, you know, these whirlpools are bringing the, all of the material that it's carrying with it in the waters uh, to the center of, of these gyres. And then there are also some other areas where you have maybe semi-enclosed spaces, for example, in the Mediterranean. And it's been shown that in the Mediterranean, uh, there is the same amount of of plastic, so the same concentration of plastic than the entire North Pacific. So, you know, this is really, this is where a lot of, of plastic can accumulate also. And so uh, Eric Van Tabiel, uh, who is um, my boss and who has, you know, been working on this, so he's the one who really uh, designed this particle tracking software and who's been working on this for, you know, for a, a really long time. Um, and who, in 2015, the whole kind of reason for, for looking into where the plastic actually ends up is because uh, his model showed that the, um, well, they, they published a, a paper, him and, and his co-authors in 2015, showing that only about 1% of this plastic that enters the ocean every year, only 1% of it is actually at the surface. So this was the, the real question, okay, if, if only 1% is at the surface, then where is the rest going, right? And so, um, one of the, the PhD students in our team, uh, Victor Onink, who uh, published a paper this year, um, was really looking at, okay, if we release, if we use the Jambeck model, which was this model of um, in 2015 that I mentioned at the beginning, which is you know, estimating how much plastic enters the ocean. So if you release that from the coastal regions, then how much of that actually ends up on the beaches? Um, and so from, in, in the kind of coastal waters, which is up to 10 kilometers off, offshore, 77% of the particles actually ended up on, in this coastal region. And so that really shows that, you know, even if, if the plastic is, is entering from the land, you know, mainly, which we saw it was 70 to 80%, then of that, that plastic that is entering from the land, most of it is actually staying close to the coastal regions. Um, and could you know end up on the beaches, and so we really see that there's this kind of movement of of plastic that goes into the open ocean um, or into the, the coastal regions, and then can go back onto the beaches, right, with tides and with waves and, and everything. So, um, so that was a, a really kind of um, key uh, finding, and that therefore means that around 25% of it could be affected by you know biofouling and and what I'm looking into, which is seeing how the plastic sinks. And we're actually seeing, you know, it's we're we're going to publish our results in the next um, the next couple of months, hopefully. But we're seeing that there are some regions where you can get these this accumulation of plastic that um, stays at kind of neutrally buoyant at a certain depth. Um, and due to the fact that you've basically got biological and physical processes that are just keeping it in equilibrium, and it just stays at a at a certain depth, right? So. That can happen, but you know there are a lot of obs observations that have shown that plastic can end up at the sea floor. So there is still, you know, there's still some some kind of missing links that we need to need to look into. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically uh, what our team has has kind of seen so far. So one of the main things uh, I got from that is over the last what just more than half a century. Um, plastic pollution we've generated has is become exceptionally pervasive from the bottom of the ocean to the Arctic. Um, which is scary. Um, and I suppose, I think, as we start to wrap this up, I think one of the key questions that remains is that's been the last well, 60 years or so worth of major plastic pollution. Do we know what the future of plastic yeah, so there are also some some models on on this. So firstly, the Jambeck model that was this 2015 model, uh, they had you know predicted that there could be an increase by 10 times uh, between 2010 and 2025. 
So for just a 15 year period, they predicted that, that the total amount of plastic in the ocean could in, increase by 10. And then a, a study that's, that, that was, um, yeah, that was published last year actually, uh, Lau et al 2020, um, they have been looking at all aquatic environments. So not just the oceans, but also the rivers and the lakes. And if no action is taken, so if we keep producing and consuming plastic in the same way as today, and which is predicted to increase, then the total, um, yeah, the, basically the, the plastic litter from land to these aquatic systems could almost triple by 2040. So this is kind of, yeah, this is the trend that we're, we're seeing if we, can, we do not try to reduce the consumption, reduce the production. Um, and yeah, I think, I think there is, you know, a shift towards policy changes and, you know, decision makers, policy makers, they all, no one wants to have this plastic in the environment, right? I don't think there's any politician who says, well, it's fine with me, you know? So I think there's, there's, there is no debate on the fact that this, this is atrocious behavior and that we should, you know, we shouldn't be uh continuing this right and so depending on the way in which the the political decisions go then knowing what items actually end up in the ocean um will be affected by this right so if for example now um in the eu there's this single use plastic ban um that is being enforced uh put into place next from next month and they have all these goals for by 2025 you know 25 percent of so there, there are some things in, in place that are, um, you know, that, that are going to change how much plastic can be produced, basically. And depending on that, we will then see a shift maybe to, you know, more plastic that is actually coming from textiles or from, you know, construction work. So maybe the shift would then be to reduce that production, right? So I think it's, it's going to be a stepwise uh, change in what happens in with future plastic in, in the ocean, yeah. One final question for me before I move on to you, uh, questions sent in, uh, sent in to me by the audience. Yeah. Um, and that is, um, if there's one key message you'd like people to take away from this um, regarding plastic pollution as your position as a oceanographer, uh, what would that be? So prevention is key, right? So we really need to turn off the tap at the source. I think that a lot of people are, are um, focusing on quick fixes, which is very good for you know cleaning what is there, for example. So beach cleanups, um, whether yeah, whether it's it's beach cleanups, um, litter booms that are in the rivers to prevent the plastic from from reaching the the oceans, um, uh, you know whether it's it's um, trying, but basically what i what i'm trying to say is that you know the the actual reduction of production and consumption is is really what's what's necessary right um and whether that means that you know we we actually um dispose there's proper disposal of the plastic right so what whatever is produced by plastic because one of the, the key things to, to say is that plastic is a really incredible material, right? Since it, since the 1950s, it's really been this, this revolutionary uh, change to uh, so many things. It's, it's helped in, in so many, so many, so many ways. Um, and so it's, it's not like we want to live our lives without this, you know, without this, this material, but we can find alternatives and wherever we can, we don't need to, to use it, right? So yeah, it's, it's reduction, uh, it's correct disposal. And I think, yeah, one of the key ones there is, is that businesses should have this extended producer responsibility where it's, you know, they, they actually take responsibility for whatever products they are, are producing, even if they're, send, they're exporting it, you know, to actually go and, and make sure that in those areas, they have the proper facilities to dispose of it. And if not, then to bring it back, you know. Um, so yeah, but it's it's really preventing the plastic from ever reaching the, the oceans. Sure, excellent. Um, thanks for thinking through my questions and answering them uh, so thoroughly. Um, I'm going to move on to some uh, questions that have been sent in to me for. Um, 
And so I'm just going to quickly go through them before we wrap things up. Uh, the first one I have is what can the average person do to help at the level? As you already mentioned, we really need systemic change from businesses, but is there something um, the individual can do also? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I definitely think that there's this kind of, um, we can look at this as both a top down and bottom up approach to solve this, this issue, right? So when it comes to the top down, if we actually as, as citizens vote for politicians that take it seriously and, and understand the urgency of, of this, this issue, along with other ones, right? Um, I, I have to say that it's also, you know, we're, we're talking about plastic pollution today, but climate change is, is really the big monster, right? So it's, it's voting for politicians who see all in, environmental um, threats to the environment basically as, as urgent. Um, and also there's, you know, some of the, the advice that's, that's given is you can write a letter or you can call your, your local politicians or your municipality, but, you know, it takes a lot of effort. So there are a lot of groups out there who are already doing all that work and they're writing the letters and all you have to do is just sign the petition, right? And sometimes these petitions really get a lot of traction and, and can, can do a lot, um, yeah, have a, have a big impact. So it's, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not here to endorse any particular ones. So, you know, you can do your research and see which ones really call to you the most. Um, but, you know, that's that's something uh, else that you can do. And then it's really almost kind of doing small changes in your life. That is I, I've, I've almost seen it as for me, it's kind of gamification. So if you have the financial means. Right. So I'm, I'm not saying that this is for everyone in the globe that they can do this. But if you have the financial means to try to, like, take a, a few items and see and see if you can change it to uh, something that is without plastic. Right. Whether this is going out to the if you go to the supermarkets, you you know, you take all of your loose fruits and veg and you can use, uh, you know, a paper, reusable paper uh, bag, for example. Um, I know in the UK, it's, you know, having your own uh, reusable bag and reusable bottle and mug is a very kind of more common thing that I've seen here in the Netherlands, for example, is not as common. So, you know, really making this part of your routine to, to as soon as you go out of the door, you have your those three items always with you so that, you know, um, and and then, you know, for example, it's this whole um, yeah, smaller items of plastic within one big, so like a crisp packet, for example, you have like six small uh, packets within one large one. And, you know, if you just buy in bulk, so you buy one big plastic uh, bag, if you have to buy plastic, I mean, and then, you know, have Tupperware so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't get stale. You know, Tupperware is an incredible, uh, <laughs> incredible invention right like cling film why do we need it if you have tupperware you can put can keep your your food fresh that way right um so it's, it's just little things and and you'll see that you know then it, it kind of becomes natural to go on to the next step and it, it doesn't doesn't seem like um an effort because you know it's, it's becoming part of your routine and it's yeah it's almost almost like a game so uh, yeah that's something that that i've i've personally um place into into my life um, and then I think just talking about it right so normalizing the fact that this is something that should be talked about and that you know you everyone has that that kind of uh, that awkward conversation maybe with the family and you know you have someone that's in your family that's set in their ways and just trying to you know talk them through it and, and show them what little things that they can do right because I do think that behavioral change is you know is, is also, we have to think about all the stakeholders that are part of this, that can be part of the solution. We all, all have to play our, our roles, right? Um, and even if the politicians have, can have the most impact by changing laws and, you know, incentivizing businesses and people by having, you know, carrot stick type of, you know, and whenever there's any financial, um, either incentive or punishment, you know, people will act faster. But I do still think that it can come from each person too. I think it's it's really top down and bottom up. Yeah. Are ocean garbage patches actual islands? Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So this is this is actually one of the most common misconceptions and misunderstandings. So um, I think you know through the media and everything, there's been some images of these 
there's very concentrated areas of, of plastic, but that can happen really very, very rarely on, you know, it's maybe a very small scale and it's one feature because of some winds and, and whatever, but um, really in the, this North Pacific region, um, it's more of a, a plastic soup. And as you have seen, you know, from, from what I've said, there's a lot more of the smaller part, uh, pieces than the large pieces, right? So on average, it's actually only about one uh, piece of plastic per meter squared in the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So definitely cannot walk on it or put a flag on it or anything. It's like not an, an island at all. Yeah. So, so this is, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's important to know that if you, you could even be in the middle of it and maybe not see plastic for a few kilometers, right? Yeah. So we're actually very quickly running out of time. Um, before I do, just one last question is, where can we find out uh, more information or further information on the you raised today? Uh, more, more information on, um, on our research and on, on the topic. Yeah, so um, yeah, firstly, we have, our team has a Twitter account if you want to follow that. So it's called You Follow the Ocean and you with a, a capital U. Uh, we can add it in the chat if, if, um, if you would like. You can also follow me on, on Twitter. I'm Delphine, at Delphine Bell. Um, and then there are also, so I, I recently found this, um, yeah, this, this basically it's, it's called Our World in, in Data. Uh, it's, it's a website where they synthesize lots of information about um, plastic, uh, sorry, about any uh, scientific data and um, really give you the, the key points and you know, what we know so far and, and the closest estimates. So uh, that's another link that, that I can send, send through to you. Um, but yeah, I thought that that was, it was a really great, great place for me to, you know, start getting my, my thoughts together, for example, for this, for this webinar, because it really highlights a lot of the key, key points. Um, yeah, so those are three, three different places where more information can be found. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. All right. Um, we're just about out of time, so I'm going to now close the webinar. So firstly, uh, thank you Delphine for spending time with us today and explaining uh, ocean plastic pollution from your perspective as an expert. Um, I'd like to thank the audience today and everyone who sent in their uh, questions beforehand, beforehand um, so I can get through all of them. Um, but uh, thanks to everyone who has participated before. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close the webinar and thank you for attending. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Simon. Bye.